Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Marty Otani, the host of Getting High on Anthropology. Uh, today we have a guest, Jessica Nyworth from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Welcome to the show, Jessica. Thanks, Marty. Glad to be here. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. And um, what's great about having you as a guest, you have this expertise focusing on marijuana. So why don't you tell us about um, your title and then give us sort of like a day in the life of Jessica working <laughs> in CDPAG. Sure, so I'm the Retail Marijuana Education Youth Prevention Coordinator. Just rolls right off the tongue like most things for the <laughs> titles for the state. Um, really what that entails is a lot of things. So kind of juggle a lot of different work. So part of my job is to work with our communications specialist who works does the social marketing campaigns, which I'm sure we'll talk about, for our public education work. Also have a number of community partners that I work with, so managing those contracts, making sure that they have everything they need, um, that they have support from my team to do the work that they do best in the community. I work on some policy efforts um, to make sure that we are preserving public health and any bills that were coming up, um, and also you know, just checking out what bills are on the table um, to be aware of. Uh, another piece of my job is a lot of community education. So I do presentations, workshops in the community, as well as work with other states and recently Canada. Okay, so pretty uh, broad portfolio. <laughs> um, it sounds like a lot of fun. So before we go deeper into some of the things that you talked about, just to educate myself and viewers, is the money that's paid to you and to your, um, the group of people you work with, is it from cannabis in terms of like the taxes? So kind of explain that a bit, if that's actually the case. Yeah, sure. So uh, um, most state agencies actually receive marijuana tax cash dollars. And so that actually comes from taxes collected at point of sale, um, predominantly that's put into the state state fund, and there are a number of different agencies that have work spelled out from them from the legislature of what we're tasked to do. And so the state health department has a couple of things that we do. We manage the medical marijuana registry. Uh, we do research and data collection. Uh, we do waste management, which is super exciting. And we also do the retail marijuana education program, which is my work. And so the funds are Sometimes they'll go directly, you know, through state legislature um, and put it in the general fund and then divvied out as bills come up and work gets um, pieced out. And then a lot of times it'll come directly to my department or to the Department of Education in the form of grants and the school construction fund, um, as well as Department of Revenue, which does the marijuana, educa uh, marijuana enforcement division, which is all the regulatory body. Mm -hmm. So in this uncertain environment with the Trump administration and potentially a gray area about what's going to happen at the federal level, in your office, is there concern that potentially the stream of funding could end if there's a major change at the federal level? I mean, it's always a consideration. You know, marijuana is still illegal federally, so you know, everything we've been doing to date has been illegal federally. Uh, so. Until recently, there was the Cole memo, which basically the DEA said, we're not going to prosecute um, marijuana business in, in states. Uh, this is state law as long as you do X, Y, Z, which is protect young people, make sure it doesn't go out of the state, um, ensure that we are you know, reducing organized crime around this substance. Um, and as long as we kept that in place, and then recently the, this new administration has rescinded that memo. So yeah, there's a bit of concern of is this going to be, how is this going to look in Colorado? Um, you know, to be honest, we are just l wait and see. That's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, which is sort of like the approach many people are taking. They're just yeah. moving on uh, business as usual. And I think being hopeful that there's not some major you know, policy change at, at the federal level. So um, again, back to you and the work you do. So what background, what expertise do you have to be successful? Because I don't know if there's like a certificate in marijuana studies <laughs> that you have or like, you know, what's the training to do the job well? You know, it's funny you say that because I think actually there's a university in Canada that's working on a certificate in <laughs> cannabis, um, but I think I'd be the first of its kind. Uh, no, so my background is actually in youth engagement and positive youth development practices. I'm a, I was previously a youth development professional. I worked for the last three years before this job for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Colorado, um, doing a lot of similar work, um, just about youth, youth education and youth prevention, so a lot of primary prevention work. 
Uh, my background, I went to the University of Colorado here in Denver for my master's, got a master's of public administration um, from the School of Public Affairs, which is an incredible program, little plug. Uh, I majored in, or in my concentration was in nonprofit management with some local policy work in, and that management piece has really informed how going about doing this work and approaching this work has been helpful um, to make sure that you get all the right players at the table. Right. Uh, my undergrad was in sociology and psychology, so more than anything, it's just fun and exciting. Um, what's really cool about marijuana in Colorado and public health is this is a brand new field for public health altogether. So approaching this work has been really exciting um, and really given us a chance to be innovative, which in government is not that common. Um, and as you can imagine, there's not much certificates or education to back that up. So it's more, you know, what, where is the expertise already in public health and um, engagement of community and community, ed and community education? Um, and really going to where the expertise lies within each field. Right, and also um, learning on the job. Like, yeah. Because <laughs> there's so many things happening at, at once. So, um, you know, as a professor in the University of Colorado Denver in the anthropology department, I do some cannabis-related research. Mm -hmm. So whenever I have downtime and I'm with my family, there's always funny discussions that happen. <laughs> so have you found in your own life when you talk with your friends or family and they hear the kind of work that you do, has, is there any kind of antidote that's sort of like, like do they take it seriously or are they, <laughs> are they looking for you to get out of this? Because you know, there's always people who still are concerned that marijuana is a problem. And sure. so I was just curious because we all have these, you know, around Thanksgiving table or whatever, these funny conversations. Uh, I would say fascinated is probably the word that uh, would describe my family's reaction. Um, my family actually all lives in Texas, so this is completely foreign to them, um, that marijuana is legal, that the government has anything to do with it. Uh, so it's a lot of good conversation about actually how gov uh, regulating, having a highly regulated system has really created a system that is pr preserving public health, that if people use safely, legally, and responsibly, that we do see positive things in our community um, and that we can legalize marijuana and see it not impact youth use, um, not impact kind of the dangers that we have been afraid of to date. I appreciate that. And as you were talking, um, you know, thinking about the highly regulated market that we're in mm -hmm. and how some people um, use the phrase over-regulated. So I would think for some people in the business, you know, those who are licensed cannabis facilities look at people in government and elsewhere as being those responsible for administering this whole slew of, 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 of regulations. And so have you had um, any conversations or has there been any attention where people look at the state agency that you're involved in as, as just being this over-regulator, or is that kind of not come up in some of the work that you've done? Sure, so I mean, I think that's a, that's a fair thing to raise about government. Um, you know, the, actually the Department of Revenue is the one that does the, regulator, the regulations, but they, every time a new regulation comes up for the industry, they compose a stakeholder group of experts from the community, including industry as well as public health or education or whoever it's relevant to, um, to talk about what should this regulation look like? What, how would it make sense? How can we roll this out in a way that is not only most effective and most efficient um, for both you know, consumers as well as um, industry? And you know, public health, our job is to preserve, is to enact the will of the people while preserving public health. That's really our role in this and to make sure that you know, those, who, again, who are choose to use, use safely, legally, and responsibly. So I actually am part of a, the governor has a commission called the Marijuana Education Oversight Commission, and we meet every other month to discuss um, education from state agencies. What does this look like? Um, we vet campaign materials and tactics and um, community education efforts with this group to make sure that we are hitting the right tone, um, that we have industry buy-in as well as um, anti-marijuana advocate buy-in. Um, and all, all people from across both sides of the aisle are part of this committee and a part of this work. Great, now yeah. I appreciate you mentioning the committee because I know there's different committees at different levels and they do wow. so much uh, important work. Um, so now let's talk about the youth. Sure. 
with the work that you do in terms of prevention and ensuring um, limited to no access to, uh, of youth to marijuana, um, tell me about some of the youth activities you're doing now, and then how do you how do you measure if you're successful? Yeah. Great questions. And and anything in public health, we're always going to have measures, right? That is a key component of public health work. Um, so we evaluate all of our work, and we really have a couple different tactics for young people. Um, our primary one is the campaign work, so the social marketing campaigns, looking to talk directly to young people. Um, and from our research with young people before we, we created this creative, um, was young people told us the number one reason they don't use marijuana is it could get in the way of their goals. Um, that health statements that didn't resonate with them coming from us as the government, um, we know from research that scare tactics don't work and that's not something we're um, proponents of. So we, pro we created our Protect What's Next campaign that speaks directly to young people. It's digital, it's on so all social media platforms talking about what are your goals? What's gonna help you get there? What could potentially keep you from getting there? Um, we trust that young people are smart. We trust that young people are gonna make decisions for themselves. And we wanna give them the information to help them make healthy decisions for themselves. And then just to clarify, when you talk about young people, what's the ages we're talking about? And then in general, at least in my work, I've been criticized as very Denver-centric. Sure. So is the work that you're talking about throughout the state or just in the Denver metro area? Absolutely, across the state. All of our research before we create a campaign, all of our research before we create messaging, um, as well as when we do our creative testing and then when we evaluate the efficacy of the campaign afterwards is, is representative of Colorado. Um, it's really important to us to make sure we have state reach and all of our um, whether it's TV, radio, billboards, or digital ads reach across the state. We actually approach all young people. Um, all young people, adolescence is a time of growth and change, but also one of great risk. Um, you know, it is absolutely developmentally appropriate for young people to take risks, and so whether, d d does not matter what your demographic is. Um, and so we know that we want young people to take risks, but we also want them to make healthy decisions and think about the context and cons potential consequences of those risks. And so we actually reach out to all demographics in Colorado. Um, the age we are aiming at about middle school, so 12 to 13 all the way up to 20 um, is our, our pri two primary age groups for our Protect What's Next campaign. Okay. And then we also talk to the adults and the lives of young people because our research shows and the Healthy Kids Colorado survey every two years that young people tell us show that ha just having a relationship with a trusted adult, whether that's a teacher, a coach, a parent, an aunt, a cousin, whoever that is that they feel like they can trust, reduces their likelihood of, of using substances, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, tobacco, um, also has a connection, a correlation to mental health. Um, and we really work to move upstream um, and, and make sure that young people have this connection with somebody that encourages them and supports them. And so we talk to trusted adults as well. Great, and I really appreciate the um, engagement with young people because uh, young people, especially at an impressionable age in middle school, I mean, it's a great time in their lives to have the conversations. Um, some of the work you do seems really fun and upbeat. Uh, you've had competitions, I guess, where middle schoolers would submit some kind of visual stuff. So tell me about the competition, and then what were some of the things that you, that stood out for you that you thought worked really well? Yeah, um, we're really proud of the success of these campaigns and the tone of the campaign. So the Protect What's Next, again, direct to young people. We knew that we weren't reaching everybody with mostly digital tactics. Um, if you're 12, you can't have an Instagram account. Uh, for example. So we wanted to reach young people where they were most often, so we had a Protect What's Next challenge. So we put out a call to all middle schools in Colorado. Um, we had four prizes of $10,000 that young people in the schools could compete for. There was a hashtag PWN challenge, um, and then each school came up with their own their own hashtag for their campaign. And basically what they do, we sent them kits and little challenge cards did little challenges. Sometimes it was help your little brother with homework or give seven people a high five today. So some kind of like small goofy stuff um, and then some more you know challenging ones and then had young people come up with their own. And if you logged those challenges online, um, whoever had the most engagement from schools 
won the prize. Oh, fun. So we had four, four middle schools from across the state um, win this prize. I think, I don't know, like 70 something competed. Um, thousands of posts to the, to the website and videos, which was really cool. Um, four schools and we you know, had a big ceremony, brought all this giant check, had a big assembly. Um, and actually the school that I ended up presenting the check at told me it was up in uh, Greeley. They said they had recently joined two middle schools and we have a really hard time getting school spirit together and this kind of connected this feeling. Um, and this challenge really helped them um, unite together. And research also shows us that connection to school, particularly during middle school, um, is a protective factor in the lives of young people from using substances. So that was another goal of ours, was to make sure that young people felt connected to their school. Oh, that's great. No, it's good to hear the um, results from the Greeley School and um, how it affected their relationships. Yeah. So I think with these um, campaigns, some products came out of it, like videos that mm -hmm. are on the internet. So tell me about one or two of them, and then what we'll do is run them so people can see them on the show. Sure. So uh, we had a couple 30-second spots and a couple 60-second spots, like YouTube pre-rolls um, that came up, like if you're searching for cat videos online, um, they would come up and you're, if you hit our kind of target demographic uh, or age. Um, so there was a, one of... Um, a young person, you know, just uh, going after their goals. So we've got one, a young person, young man playing drums, and it'll always, it'll scroll with you know, a couple different ideas of what they're pursuing, um, passion or excitement or music or whatever it is, and then uh, protect what's next, don't let weed get in the way. Hi. Hi. You look fantastic. You too. <laughs> Find what's next for you and go get it with the Goal Getter at protectwhatsnext.com. Remember when you made a baby? Check that. Remember when you had a baby? Amazing, right? But what's more amazing is everything you've taught your baby to eat, to walk, to talk, and pretty much everything else they know. That makes you amazing. And you're still teaching them every day. Only now, it gets harder. Now it's stuff like birds and bees and booze and weed, which is awkward and messy. But when hasn't it been? Remember diapers? So don't let awkward get in your way. Talk to your kids about marijuana so you can help them keep it from getting in their way. Get tools and tips at goodtoknowcolorado.com. Welcome back to Getting High on Anthropology. I'm the host, Marty Otanias. Tonight we have Jessica Nyworth with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, Jessica, tell us about the Good to Know campaign. For someone who's never heard about it, like explain it like in a way that your grandma can understand it. <laughs> and then of course, how can people see some of the stuff um, associated with the Good to Know campaign? Sure, so our website is Good to Know Colorado. Colorado.com. Um, the idea behind that campaign, actually, we were told by the legislature in this time of chaos that right after legalization, what are the laws? Who, what, where can you use legally? How do you do this safely? Um, there was just a lot of confusion. And so legislature told us to do basically TV spots, to, to do messaging to all Coloradans as well as tourists about here are the laws. Here's how you can use safely. Here's how you can use responsibly. Here's how you can use legally. And you know, whether you choose to use or not, it's good to know. The Good to Know campaign is very Colorado. All of our research um, obviously was done here in the state. We did a lot of creative testing about different concepts that would work. And ours is super banjo-y and cartoony and rhymey. And it just resonated really well. And actually, before I started working for the state is when these campaigns launched. And so I remember seeing this billboard and thinking, like, good job. You know? <laughs> so it's nice to be on the other side of it and feel like, you know, that was something that actually really resonated with people um, to be light and friendly and not aggressive or judgmental or preachy. Uh, 100 years of prohibition from the government, we are, we are not a trusted source of information. Um, so making sure that we really hit a tone of a friendly and approachable uh, that would be well received that people would actually listen to. Um, otherwise, if no one's hearing your message, what's the point of having the message? So in addition to the Good to Know campaign, um, the other kind of uh, topic you work on is 
uh, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and marijuana use. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about some of the knowledge that you have about these issues and then any kinds of uh, delicate issues that come up when you talk about this? Because I understand it could be, um, you know, a challenge, especially with people's range of views about pregnancy, breastfeeding, and marijuana use. Sure. So, you know, what is of consideration here is that marijuana is also has medicinal uses. And so we need to be careful about, you know, who we're speaking to. Our prevention messages are all about retail marijuana, so if you're not using medically. But those lines really blur, particularly for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Um, you know, women tell us that they're using for nausea or for other reasons during pregnancy as uh, really as risk reduction, as rather than using other prescription drugs or using this instead. And so what we want pregnant and breastfeeding women to know is that there's no known safe use of marijuana. Um, you know, there is limited research on the health effects of marijuana. And in that absence of evidence, um, while we're doing more research in this topic, we know that it passes um, through, the, through the womb. We know that it passes through breast milk. Um, and so we wanna make sure that, that women know this and are aware um, you know, make sure that they're protecting their health as well as the health of the baby. Yeah, I would think especially in Colorado and I'm sure in other states where some of the THC levels are really, really high, uh, the potential consequences may be in the future problematic. So if well, someone... Actually, I would say for the potency, there's not a lot of research for potency either. So there's there's not much out there about is low potency more dangerous or is high potency more dangerous than low potency so you know until we have research on that we really don't we can't say much about how potency affects your body we really know thc affects your body but not much about whether low or high or what that threshold is that has more um damaging effects on your health. Oh, no, I'm so glad you clarify that because for potential researchers, it's mm -hmm. a great area to uh, collect more data, mm -hmm. especially evidence-based data to help then inform people's decisions and of course, uh, messaging. But what would you do, you know, I come to you and I say, oh, you know, my wife, you know, she's um, seven months pregnant. She's very concerned about not taking synthetic drugs mm -hmm. and, you know, once in a while to help with sleep or nausea, you know, she consumes marijuana. And so what would be a couple things you can suggest to me so I can have a conversation with her uh, besides going to the website and reading, you know, fact sheets and, and things like that? Sure. Yeah. So, well, number one, I would say talk to your doctor because um, we also know that marijuana has um, effects on other drugs. So if you're taking other drugs, um, other prescription drugs, um, it can have a negative effect on some of those. So it's important to know that your doctor knows um, what you're consuming as part of your plan, your health plan. Um, as well as, you know, is this something um, that's a good alternative for you? Uh, I would also say, um, you know, what we do know about the health effects is that, again, it does pass um, from the mother to the child um, while, while pregnant, and that can have ramifications later in life. Um, we don't see um, immediate afterbirth effects like with alcohol. Um, we see effects in adolescence, actually. So when a young person is in school, they might have a harder time learning, um, have a di more difficult time than their peers. Uh, and that's definitely one of the health effects that um, our research team has seen. Excellent, no, super helpful. And then um, we have a few more minutes. You also have a uh, Spanish version of some of the uh, marijuana education materials. So mm -hmm. tell me about the Spanish version. And again, I'm just curious, uh, do you feel you've been successful with that uh, program? Yeah, so we, um, we worked on the, with a number of community partners to make sure that our campaign really resonated with Spanish-speaking adults. We saw from our research that English-speaking adults had a much higher knowledge of the laws, um, but a much lower um, agreement with health effects, and the opposite was true with Spanish-speaking adults. So we knew that to make sure that we were addressing health inequities, that we had a campaign that spoke directly to Spanish-speaking adults about the laws, and then about how to talk to their young people about marijuana, um, whether it's kids or, or you know, caregivers or th through you know, their careers. And so we wanted to make sure that um, our campaign resonated. And so when we tested the Good to Know campaign with Spanish-speaking adults, it did not resonate well. So what adults told us was that 
um, it looked like the government was trying to sell them weed. <laughs> so because it was so friendly, because it was so approachable, it really just did not resonate with this audience. So we went back to the drawing board, came up with new creative, tested that with this audience, and came up with a much more public health -y kind of feel. It's direct to camera PSAs. Um, we had trusted community um, leaders do these PSA spots for us, um, and our campaign looks just looks much different. Um, and it has a much more direct and direct tone to it. But it and has really resonated. We have seen an increase in knowledge of the laws. We have seen an increase in knowledge of the laws for English speaking as well, as well as um, acceptance of health, ex health effects information. Um, actually, those who have seen the Good to Know campaign or the marijuana in Colorado campaign have two and a half more times more likely to know the laws in Colorado. And are there other versions? Because Colorado is a diverse state. Obviously, the Latino population is big, mm -hmm. so the Spanish version makes total sense. But are, are there other versions, like in different languages, or just the two, English and Spanish? Yeah, so for our, our social marketing campaigns, just in English and Spanish, our print materials, on the other hand, are, are translated into seven languages. So all of our fact sheets about you know what is marijuana, what the message of use, talking tips, um, marijuana and your baby, we have a number of fact sheets down, you can download for free from our website on goodtoknowcolorado.com or you can order if you are looking to send to your business um, at cohealthresources.com or .org. Both of those will get you there. And then they're all free materials um, developed from our program and from our partners at Amelie and Cactus. Great. So I love marijuana, the topic of marijuana. So preparing for the interview, I read that it's not advisable to dump marijuana down the toilet. Okay, <laughs> so in one of the presentations you have done or you plan to do uh, with young people and parents in schools, it's advisable if you get someone and you you get you confiscate the marijuana, um, don't flush it down the toilet. Of concern here is definitely the environmental impacts. Um, as if you if you legalize marijuana, you of course will see um, increased availability of this substance, right? And if you have an increased availability, you definitely will have an increased availability of people flushing it down the toilet. <laughs> As if it happened before, likely it will happen after. What we really want you to do is, if you have it in your home, if you're a parent or you have a child or a young person, an adolescent in your house, to keep it locked away, um, out of sight, out of reach. Um, and they sell lock boxes for like 10, 20 bucks. Um, and some of them even have charcoal, so you can't smell it. So if you're planning to get rid of it, you can actually take it to a prescription drug disposal center or to your local police department and just turn it in. Because it's legal for you as an adult over 21 to have up to an ounce of marijuana on you. Um, that is the law. It is actually your constitutional right. Um, so you will not get in trouble for turning in marijuana, um, but your child would. Right, excellent. Yeah. No, thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, you know, it seems like you really enjoy, you love your job. I mean, you have this enthusiasm about it. So for others who want your job or a job like yours, what would you recommend a couple things that could be done to secure employment, either with CDPHE or just in general in public health and prevention uh, focusing on youth? Sure. So something I haven't really talked about much um, during this conversation is our community education work. I work with a number of great community partners who are embedded in the communities they work in, um, as well as I do presentations myself in around the state as well as working with other states um, and other countries about lessons learned here in the state. So I would say, number one, be a good public speaker is definitely a prerequisite for the job. Number two, it's all about relationship management. This is a tough gig when you need to be a neutral party in, in the midst of very passionate voices. Um, so re managing relationships is a really big part of my job and I highly, highly recommend um, if that's something you're already skilled at, public health is actually a good field for you. Um, the third would be policy work. Um, I am so glad that I took some policy classes when I was in grad school because it has paid off to no end to have just that basic foundation.